can it otherwise like we just do some settings here. Yeah. So, is that better? Yeah. Okay, we'll see. So, uh, okay, I have to stay on this side. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, I was asked to come here and talk about being brave and being vulnerable. Um, so, some disclaimers. I am not an expert on this. Uh, it's a very personal subject for me. Uh, which is why I started talking about it, because I think some of the things that we miss uh, in our workplace is to talk about ourselves and be ourselves. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Please feel free to make comments. Um, and if I don't see them, just shout at me. Um, so that's about all the disclaimers. So um, this is a very personal subject. I did it last year for the first time. Um, I was terrified. Uh, I was really shaking and trying to repair it and finding this really, really difficult. But the more I talk about it, the more it makes sense to talk about this particular subject. Because I think it is so important to the way we work. So this used to be me. I used to be a real nerd. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. Well, actually, this is not me because I would never wear that colorful clothes. I had that much makeup. Um, <laughs> So I used to be really, really shy when I started in IBM in 2006. One of my first goals was to speak up in my team. So I was afraid of even speaking up in my team. Um, I, I managed to avoid almost all my school time to go up to the board and explain something because I was really terrified of this. So the more I could hide, the more I could fall in with the wall. As, I don't know if that's a term you have here in Africa. But we have that in Denmark. You try to fall in with the walls and nobody sees you. You're kind of just there. Um, so this is where I am now. <laughs> um, actually, it started as a joke because I was at this session where we were doing, um, I'm an agile coach now. So I work with other agile coaches. And we were training new agile coaches. And somebody had a cup and it fell and I grabbed it. I have no clue why. I cannot grab a ball. But and they called me the Scrum Ninja. Um, and then I just kept it because my nephew thinks it's so cool. Because I'm also a pirate. Um, and he, he knows I'm a pirate, now he knows I'm also a ninja. And somehow I think that we are all ninjas in each of our fields. Um, we are good at something and we are all ninjas. So I like to keep that image. But there are so many other sides of me. So I'm very much an ant. And as you might be able to see, um, I'm also a pirate. My nephew is now seven, still believes I'm a pirate. He believes that is what I do half time. I go out and I fight evil pirates. Um, of course, I also tell stories to help him stay um, believing that. Um, the other part of my job at the moment is just as cool to him because I'm an agile coach with Lego, uh, which you probably all know, the toys, um, which is so cool. Um, so I've been there for, for four months now and will be there until the end of the year where I'm helping their software department. Um, but other than that, I am also a big geek. So as you may have noticed, I do like Yoda. Um, and I used to hide this all the time because that's not what grown-ups do. We don't like green goblins, as my family calls it. We don't like dragons. Um, this is from, it's really hard when you have two. This is from my 40th birthday where I had this big turquoise dragon for my birthday cake. Um, so I'm all these kind of things, and I try to, to help my, my nephews and nieces to grow up to believe in themselves as well. And of course, I'm always a very, very serious speaker, go to conferences and talk. Um, so that's me now, going around, talking about a lot of different subjects, helping organizations transform. Um, I say that I'm an agile coach, but basically I go out to help people. That's what I want to do. I want to make the world a better place. And I think one way I can do that is go into companies and help them. Uh, which I also didn't say before because people will just call you a hippie. And they still do, but I just go, yep, I'm here. I have peace earrings, I'm a hippie. So if we look at what courage and bravery means, um, if you look in a dictionary, it's about the quality of mind of facing difficulty and danger without fear. 
And as an obsolete, it is also the heart as a source of emotion. Um, you can also say it's about having the courage of your convictions. And if you look at being brave, it's just possessing courage. So what I find really problematic about this one is the without fear part. Because we feel fear for a reason. We feel fear because there's something dangerous. If you do not feel fear, then you are dead. You will jump out of an airplane without a parachute because you have no fear. So we need this fear to tell us that there is something dangerous. So I believe that being brave and, and not having, it's not about not having fear because if you don't have fears, you're just stupid. If you just do a lot of stuff and you're not afraid of anything, that's not being brave, that's just doing stuff. And the fear that comes to us is because we need it. So my definition of being brave is it's not about removing our fears. It's not about not being afraid. It's about doing what is necessary even if we are afraid. So as an example, I have this nice tattoo called Be Brave, um, inspired from South Africa by Sam who has it as well. I knew I wanted a tattoo and I didn't know what it wanted and then when I saw this sentence on Sam's arm, I'm kind of like, this is what I need. I want to have this so every day I'm reminded to be brave enough to be myself. The problem is I'm terrified of needles. So actually when he did the first two letters, I was kind of like, okay, I need a break. <laughs> and I don't mean that the whole two letters, I mean the surroundings of the first two letters. <laughs> Uh, so I had to lie down for the rest of it. But this tattoo is so important to me that I needed to have it done no matter how terrified I was. And to me, this is what courage means, that if something is important to you, you do it despite your fears. And you let your fears, because your fears are there to tell you stuff. So the other part of being brave is actually the obsolete part. So courage is from Latin, uh, cur, so means heart. So actually in the old days, it would be speak from your heart. So open your heart and speak from your heart. And this is what courage means to me a lot today, is to show your heart. To go out there and show your heart. So actually stand up for what you believe in, and also making yourself vulnerable. I think we have a tendency to go to work, for instance, and be another person. We leave some of the stuff behind and we go to work and we're this nice work person who just fits in. But to me, that's only half a person. And we are really bad at, at going in there and showing vulnerabilities, showing that we have a bad day, showing that we need help. And to me, being brave is also very much about going to a point where you are able to be vulnerable. So I used to very much not be this. I used to hide everything because if you are in control, if you hide everything, nobody can hurt you because you are in control. And if you don't take chances, you don't get disappointed. The other part of that is you also don't get surprised in a nice way because you know exactly what you're going to get if you don't take chances. So you're never going to explore the extra things. So the part of your heart is about being vulnerable it's about making yourself in a place where you are vulnerable. So vulnerable means a lot of things. It, it means that you can get hurt. So you need to, to decide with yourself, I, am I ready for the risk of getting hurt if I want to be vulnerable? Because that might happen. If you open your heart, somebody will take a stab at you. But most people won't. And you will be amazed about the things that happen once you open your heart. And the other part of this is standing up for what you believe in. So if I look at this for me personally, um, it's about standing up for who you are, even when your surroundings find you strange. So this is my nephew. He is 15 years old, and he is a huge Doctor Who fan. <laughs> we also have one over here. So we have, yeah. The fourth doctor was cool. <laughs> okay, so my nephew thinks the 11th doctor is really cool, which is why he's wearing a fez. He's also having red dispensers, I think it's called. Suspensers, well, yeah, suspenders. 
he, and this was actually, so we have confirmation in Denmark. So when you're 14, you, con you confirm your birth. And he was actually wearing it with the fez because he's a huge Doctor Who fan. And this is actually, uh, there was this showing of the first um, episode with the 13th Doctor. So I went with him to the movies and I actually had to go look up what did the 11th Doctor look like and dress up as his companion or as best I could. But nobody in my family gets this. So his parents think it's silly. His schoolmates think it's silly. They have no clue and they think it's a bit strange. And I mean, going with a bow tie to school is what a lot of people will find strange. But he does this because this is what he believes in. He's really very much into this. He's called himself a Wuvian. He's a member of the Danish Wuvian Society. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, but I think this is very, very important. And I think that this has been very important to me because I always tried to fit in. I was always the good girl. I was smart. I did my homework. I did what everyone expected of me. And all the other sides that I had, I just pushed it a little bit down. It was there, but still, every time you get somebody like, like my parents asking, why do you want children's books for Christmas? You're not a kid. Um, why do you like dragons? Dragons are not real. Well, just ask my nephew. He will tell you they're real. They just lived in the old days. Uh -oh. so, so all these things, society pushing you into being someone. Also being someone because you're a woman. I'm not your standard woman. It took me like, I forgot the whole teenage part where you learn to put on makeup and walk in high heels. I kind of forgot that. I was reading a book. Which means that when you come out in society and try to be a consultant, you're kind of like, oh, fuck. <laughs> what do I do? And especially as an IBM consultant, they have rules. Like, you cannot wear jeans when you teach. You have to wear a skirt or black slacks. I was like, okay. So I go out, I buy new shoes, I buy new pants. I go to uh, Estee Lauder booth and help them teach me to use makeup. Um, which I have now learned, and I'm very comfortable with it, and I also wear dresses and stuff like that. But all the time, I was met with all these things about how I was supposed to be, and I tried to fit in. So what I found out was that this has been hurting me all my life. Because by hiding who I am, I'm also shutting everyone else out. And I'm also shutting out the connections that I'm able to have. So by being who I am, by embracing, yes, I am a geek. And I'm proud of it, and it's fun. And yes, I like to have discussions like who makes the best music in Star Wars, which is the Empire, just so you know it. <laughs> um, but having, working with developers, being in an environment where we can actually discuss these things for lunch, or other kinds of things like how do you make corn circles? It's the Smurfs. They're small enough to get in, and they have enough people to actually make the corn circles. So now you know. Um, <laughs> So stuff like that, that you can actually even go in and discuss these things. And if I even mention that to my family, it's like, oh. I have a friend who calls me goddess. So I, every morning I greet her on Skype and I say, hello, most beautiful one. And she says, hello, goddess. And this feels nice. Sometimes we do, that's all we do. So for one Christmas, she gave me this really cool book about how to raise dragons and wrote an, an offering for, for the goddess. And my dad just looks at this and puts it down. It's kind of, mm, mm. So they have, and this is what I've been fighting. So I've been trying to fit in. And now I just stopped fighting because I found out that it's OK to be me. It is not only OK to be me, it's great to be me. And what everyone else says doesn't matter anymore. Oh, that's not true. It matters. And it hurts when somebody says, like, oh, you want Lego for Christmas, but you're not a baby. I'm kind of like, no but I can play with Lego, and it's mine. Um, so my surroundings do find me strange. And I think that is um, an asset for me in my work as an agile coach. So I used to develop a little bit when studying computer scientists. I used to be a tester. So I'm kind of one of the guys, which helps me um, talk to people. But I'm also a girl, which me, or a woman, which means that they have a little bit of positivity towards me because I'm a woman. So me coming in is not as much as a danger as one of the alpha males. 
That's just because they don't know me. They think I'm nice and soft. <laughs> um, so I can beat most of them in a pissing contest, and I do sometimes, but they don't see me as dangerous. And the fact that I do strange stuff also helps me in my work. So you also need the courage to be different, um, to stand out. So this is me at Talk Like a Pirate Day. I hope you all celebrate that. On the 19th of September, you're supposed to talk like a pirate. Um, the comment, I put that on Facebook, and my friend's comment was, oh, I get why you're single. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would never have done this a few years ago. I, would, I might talk as a pirate at work, but I would never show it openly. And it's also about making yourself vulnerable. And this was really, really hard to me because I spent like 30, 40 years protecting myself. And getting out there and making yourself vulnerable is really, really hard. Especially the first times you get hurt. But then when you see the magnificence that comes with being vulnerable, like some of the people I met, I used to think that to me a soulmate in the, two years, in the old days, three years ago, <laughs> three and a half years ago, a soulmate to me was somebody you met, a partner you had for life. But I realize now that the Germans call it sailing for Binung, so soul connections. And I, within the last two years, I found 10 people that I have a connection with so strong. It's like I met them before, like we were meant to meet. But there's love so strong, stronger than ones I ever had with any of my partners. Because my heart used to be this small and contained and protected. And now it's this big. So when you open your heart, you open your heart to such strong connections that you have no idea. And it's totally crazy. It's about speaking up when something is important to you. So if something is really important to you, speak up. We tend to have a lot of things that's important to us, but not talk about them. Um, and then it won't change, because somebody else might not know that this is an issue or this is important to you. So whether it's in your teams or at work or at home, you need to speak up when things are important to you. And it's about sharing your fears and joys. So I'm very active on Twitter. Um, and one of the things that people say who follow me, who keep following me because I'm very active, uh, say is you also share your fears. So you actually go out and say when you're afraid of something, when you messed up. Like I became independent a year ago, and the first five months of this year I didn't have anything to do. Uh, and I became, in the beginning I was like, okay, I'm fine. I have lots of time. That's good. No problems. And then as time went on, I became scared and kind of like, oh, did I make the wrong choice? Should I just have stayed in this nice job where I actually got a decent pay? And I got to work with Agile. I didn't like management, but I did, I did work with it. And should I do something else? And I shared it on Twitter. And what happened was that people wrote back to me and said, yeah, I tried that. I've been there. So sharing my fears also helps me get feedback. And sometimes it's nice to show that you are a full person. We tend to only share all the good stuff. But sharing your fears um, is also important. So the reason it's important to me, I already said this, but I kind of feel like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Uh, from trying to hide, being gray. So if you look at my wardrobe four years ago, it was gray, dark blue, black. If you look at my wardrobe today, um, it's turquoise, it's pink. It might also be black or whatever. But I stand out in a crowd. I, one of, my, actually one of my cousins said to me the other day, when you come into a room, you, you kind of enter the room, you take the whole room. But you used to do kind of just crawl at the walls. So what happened to me was um, the Agile Coach Camp in Germany in 11. So I had heard about this coach camp the year before. Uh, so basically it's a bunch of Agile people, coaches, scrum masters, whoever's interested in Agile, who meet for a weekend in the woods in Germany. So we have this cool place. In the middle, we have big rooms where we can have open spaces. And we have a so it's a hotel. So we also stay there the full weekend. And I was terrified of going. I hate flying. I hadn't, I hadn't been in a plane for six years. Um, I feel uncomfortable meeting new people. 
I feel uncomfortable in the crowd. But one of my friends told me, you have to go to this, and I'll be there. And he wasn't. <laughs> because he had to cancel. So I went to this place with 70 people I didn't know, and I was terrified. And I felt like, am I even allowed to be here? And I think a lot of people have this. Sometimes we come into a place and we're kind of like, we know, logically, we know we're allowed to be there, but we feel like, am I even, is it okay? Maybe I should just sit in this corner. And then what happened was that this community embraced me. So actually, after being here for about two hours in the opening, I gave a lightning talk of three minutes. So what is your passion? Why are you here? and stood up and talked about why I work with Agile, stuff that I had never spoken about before, about how I want to help people, about how I want to make the world better. I want to make the world better. I want us to make better products. But mostly, I want to help people. And all of a sudden, I found a community who not only accepted me, but who appreciated me. And I found out that it was OK. And that some of the crazy stuff I did was actually OK, and somebody found this cool. And to me, this was an epiphany. I was kind of like totally blown out. I came home from this weekend, and people were like, have you been drug on drugs all weekend? I was smiling. I was, and before this, I would never laugh out loud. So if I saw a funny movie, I would you know, not make any noise. And now I laugh out loud. But all this. I was always trying to hide myself, and then figuring this out. So after going to this, so this is me now, well, actually a few years ago. So this is me and my work husband. So we do different stuff together. We work together at IBM. Uh, we just did a Agile Games Day about developing Agile games. And we have a blog together. So we were trying to make this really professional picture uh, of us standing there and looking really professional. And I just couldn't because he was standing there with his phone trying to hide that he was taking pictures and trying to look really serious and stuff. And that's kind of where I am now, you know, open, laughing, having fun. So this is why it is so important to me to do all this. And also because I found out that I need to be myself. And I need to be myself with all that I am. And not just be the angel. So I'm going to do an attempt to go over here and see if it works. Because um, I feel like I'm neglecting you. <laughs> I wish this wasn't here so I could just walk back and forth. So I used to be the white side. I used to just be the angel. Um, being the nice girl, always doing what people expected of me. And I found out that, yes, I can do that, but it hurts me. And it hurts me a lot to just be that nice person all the time. And it's not that I have a really dark side. Well, maybe. Not a dark, dark side. But I do have things that doesn't fit in. And to some people, this is the dark side. So getting a tattoo was bad. Oof. I mean, it wasn't a problem when my sister got one, because she was the rebel. But when I got a tattoo, people were like, whoa. And Aren't you afraid you won't get a job? I'm kind of, if people can't accept this, I'm not going to work there. Oh, but you need to work. Uh, well, kind of. I need the money sometimes, but um, work is not the most important thing, which is really bad because in my family it is. Uh, I'm the only one who went to university, and I was called stupid because there, were, were, there was a job at the sausage factory. And that's a lit oh, it's not a literal quote because they said in Danish. But I was actually told, why do you take a second university education when there are jobs at the sausage factory? Because the most important thing is to have a job. So last year, I quit twice without having a job. So I'm really, I'm really in the bad zone. Um, I was with IBM for a long time and found that in the beginning, I loved IBM. But I found that they, their focus became more and more on utilizing, making as many money as possible, where my goal was to make the client as happy as possible and hopefully make money. So I had to leave. Um, 
I'm not sure if it's that in all parts of, of IBM, but where I was, that was the focus. Our, our targets was to put in as many hours as possible. Uh, we even had uh, rewards. So anyone who had been there more than 40 hours a week was eligible for a money award. Um, and I just couldn't anymore. It took me two years to get there. Um, and actually, it wasn't until I started growing, I started figuring out that I was okay, <laughs> that I had the courage to leave. But when I left last year, I just had the feeling something would come along. I didn't know what. I just had this calmness inside, which is really, really strange to relate to when you've been a control freak all your life. Uh, I used to control everything. I mean, and I still like my spreadsheets, and I like to have everything in order. But actually, I went here without even knowing uh, where the hotel was. So if this has been like a few years ago, I would know exactly where the hotel was. I would have printed a map of Cape Town. I would have had directions with public transportation, even though I would take a cab just in case. And here I just kind of, OK, I had the name and the address. I, I'm going to find it somehow. Oh, oh, I kind of forgot that I made the hotel pick me up. So, so I kind of you know, changed a lot in this way. And I just couldn't stay in IBM because I found out that it was hurting me. It was killing me staying there. So I had to leave. Um, then I joined another company, and I found out that, boy, that was difficult. Because all of a sudden, I was working with all these cool people. It is so hard when you've been the smartest one for a long time to go into a company of cool people. And you're just one of the smart people. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that also takes a lot of courage to go in and actually admit, now you're not the smartest one. And the hardest one to admit it to was myself. So that was also a big challenge to going in and figuring out, OK, I'm not the smartest one. You know, even though I knew that logically, I've always been in surroundings where I was the smartest one. I was the one who understood Agile, not only the rules, but I actually understood the values and how people reacted. And the reason I'm called Native Wired is because Lisa Atkins uh, writes about it in her book about Agile coaching, that some people are Native Wired to be Agile coaches. We just do it naturally. So it just comes to us. And then coming in to work with all these cool people who knew all kinds of stuff and who knew all these kinds of models. And it was so amazing and so frustrating. And I had some differences with management, so I decided to leave. Um, because I was starting to behave in a way I used to. So instead of saying when I had a problem, I started to duck. And I just. The first time I did that, I was kind of like, I don't want to go back to ducking all my life, to hiding, to ducking, to avoiding confrontation just because it's difficult. So I quit again. And that's how I became independent, because like, oh, should I get a job? Maybe. Well, OK. Maybe I should try independent. I had my domain, so I still don't have a web page. Uh. So I decided to become independent. Uh, which might be a good choice, might be a bad choice. I still haven't got the marketing part. I have no clue how to get clients. Uh, luckily, I have a nice company in Aarhus, where I live, who's really good at getting clients and don't have enough agile coaches. So it works with that. Um, so I didn't think about all this. And that might be taking it a bit too far, especially if you have wife or kids and stuff like that. They might need food. And, I mean, if it's just yourself, you can take this decision if you have people who depend on you. But I was kind of, OK, I have my apartment. If everything goes wrong, I can sell my apartment. I can go live with my friend. I'm never going to live with my parents again. <laughs> I can barely survive a weekend. So um, I would kill someone if I had to live with them. Um, but I had some friends, and she, she called me. And she says, well, uh, we have a guest room. If everything goes wrong, you can live there until you, you get enough money to get your own place. So people were backing me up on this. Um, so I decided to just go for it. Um, and being all part of me, so being, I can be very serious. Um, I'm a very good listener. Even though I talk a lot, I can also be a very good listener. Um, so I have the ability to make people talk if I just sit and listen to them. So they will tell me stuff they didn't think they want to tell anyone. Which is also, it's a gift and it's a burden sometimes. But people talk to me and tell me all kinds of stuff. Um, by the way, being silent is the hardest part of being an agile coach. Because sometimes you know what they have to do. 
and you stand there and you bite your tongue forever because they're not doing it. Um, but I'm also the talker. I'm also the one giving talks like this. I do at work, I do inspiration sessions, which is one and a half hour where I talk about a subject. I do trainings. I do all kinds of stuff. I do mentoring. So there's all these parts of me. There's the hard part who knows all the theory and who can Sometimes I'm, well, I haven't coded for 10 years, but I can still speak the language, but I also know about other stuff. I'm starting to learn about how the brain works, how um, motivation works and stuff like that. And there's all these parts of me, and somehow I tried to fit into all these boxes, and now I totally don't. So what I decided was, okay, I'm going to be all of me. I'm going to be the dragon with the heart. So these are from Ikea. Um, this is a hand puppet, actually. And it does look like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, but it is a dragon because it, it's, what do you call it? It puts out fire. So um, it must be a dragon. But I really like them because, they, to me, they symbolize this cool creature that is a little bit mythical, but it's cool and it's strong and it has a big heart. So to me, a dragon is like the one in dragon heart. It has a huge heart. It's a good person. It might look really strong and might have to do some things sometimes, but it has a big heart. And I need to be all of this. I need to be my big heart, and I need to do, sometimes do difficult things and tough things and be a dragon. So when, actually, when I was a scrum master, they called me the dragon because they said, oh, you were standing by the, what do you call the water around the castle? Moat. So I would be standing by the moat, and somebody would come in and say, okay, excuse me, can I help you? And they would call me the dragon because they would be in the castle and they would do their programming and their testing and I would protect them uh, most of the time. So sometimes, of course, we would let people in, but when sometimes we really needed protection, I would be the dragon. So they actually put up a sign over my uh, space that says, here be dragons. Um, and I'm a dragon lady. Uh, that also is from one of the coach camps where we actually found out we were eight ladies there who really loved dragons. Each one of us had dragon tattoos, um, dragons at home, so in some form or another. So we decided to form the tribe called Dragon Ladies. Um, and that's also part of who I am. I love dragons. I love pirates. I love all this mythical stuff. And I love that it can teach us a lot of things. Actually, a lot of the things that we can use is from fairy tales, or from, like Winnie the Pooh, for instance. So when I do retrospectives, I quote from Winnie the Pooh about Edward Bear bumping down, here comes Edward Bear bumping down the stairs on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming down the stairs, but he thinks there must be another way if only he could stop for a moment and think about it. So actually, Winnie the Pooh talks about retrospectives. Um, one of the other talks I, I just started doing is about stress and depression, because I also think that's something we need to talk about. And if you look at Eeyore, he's actually depressed. But what happens with him is his friends accept him for who he is. They bring him along, and they don't expect him to be anyone else that he is. They're not telling him to be happy. They're not telling him to cheer up. But they include him on all their ventures. So actually, Eeyore talks to us about how to handle people with depression and stress. So I think that we can learn a lot from these things if we just choose to look into them. So moving into more, um, what can I say, um, not about me. Well, probably be about me anyway. Um, so this is from Søren Kierkegaard. He is a Danish philosopher, and he says, to dare is to lose your footstep momentarily, not to dare is to lose yourself. And I think this is what courage is very much about. It's about losing yourself for a moment. And that's okay. But I also think it's very important to emphasize the momentarily. So sorry about the animation. I couldn't remove it because my program crashed. Um, so this is, um, I don't know how I'm going to do this with two, okay. So this is uh, about how we like to be. So the green is where we really like to be. This is our comfort zone. This is where we know stuff. 
we are used to this, this is our habit. This is also where our brain likes to be because our brain likes to do things automatically because when we can do things automatically, we can sp spend the other brain power on other stuff. Um, so what I used to be was to be in my comfort zone all the time. So when we start to be brave, what we need to do is go into the learning zone. So we need to step out momentarily and go into the yellow zone and try out stuff. I think that one of the problems with courage is that a lot of people step out into the red zone, the danger zone. So they take a big step out. And what happens is it becomes dangerous. It hurts them somehow. Which means that we tracked into the comfort zone and they just stay there. Or worse, they break down. But what the other issue with this is, and what I found out very much, because I've been growing rapidly over the last 10 years, and especially the last four has been crazy, is that if you are out in the learning zone too long, you will drift out into the danger zone. You will become stressed. You will become, well, in my case, I will become depressed because I'm prone to depression. So if you stay in the, uh, in the learning zone for too long, you will move out into the danger zone. So challenging yourself all the time can be really, really, really dangerous. And the funny thing is that if we talk about exercise, about running, I'm not, I don't know a lot about running. I have friends who run. That's how much I know about it. But, <laughs> but I do know that when you go running, for instance, if you go for a marathon, you don't go for two marathons in a row. Your body needs to build up again. So you need to rest, you need to, especially the first few days, you need to just rest to be able to get on your feet again. But your body needs to rebuild. So you need to have these periods of not running, of not doing exercise. And if you have a good exercise <coughs> program, you will have things where you do exercise and then you rest, and exercise and then you rest. Or some people just do exercise the arms and then the legs and then the arms and then the legs. But at least part of you rests. And that's what we need to do with our brain as well. So that means that if you go out into the learning zone, um, whether it is learning something or it's about being brave, you need to remember to go back into your comfort zone and rest. Otherwise, you will be stressed. Because our, that is, our, our mind needs as much rest as we do, as our bodies do. It's a big muscle, and we need to rest it as well. And being brave, which is our heart, needs the same rest. Because if, we just, if we're just brave all the time, at some point, we get out into the outer rim and things become dangerous to us. So we need to pull in and rest. And that can be really, really hard, especially if you're on a roll and you want to um, try new stuff again and again and again. So that's why I bring this. It's for two things. So one is the whole don't go directly into the danger zone. So when I started doing... Um, I didn't just go out and do public speaking. So what I started doing was um, I started actually talking in my team, which was really, really hard. My next step was to go into high schools and talk about what is it like to be a woman in IT. Because that would be like 10 girls. And that's not really that dangerous. And then I would move into talking at schools where there were more people. And then I started moving into education fairs, which is something we have in Denmark, where we have all these educations represented at like a big fair, and they all have booths, and you can come talk to them. And they give talks. So I did for computer science. So there would be somebody from university talking about how is the school, what, what subjects do we have, et cetera. And I would talk about what happens when you come out into real life afterwards. And that's actually the first time I realized that, holy shit, I'm standing in front of 80 people, and I'm not scared. And that was totally amazing to have this feeling being among all these people and not being scared. Um, so real public speaking at conferences I've only done for one and a half year. Uh, that only came after the coach camp and, and believing more in myself. Um, but I had um, a stress in the meantime. I had to go down for nine months because I moved into the danger zone. Um, so I know how hard it can be. And I'm still sucking at it. Because there's so much cool stuff to do. It's so much easier to say no to non-cool stuff. But when there's a lot of cool stuff, that's the big problem. 
So some of the examples of how I use this as an agile coach um, to show how you can use this in agile. So one is from, I was working at Danske Bank uh, in Denmark, which is a big bank, and they needed a new agile coach. So what they told me is, um, we need an agile coach who's not afraid to speak her mind, even if it's in disagreement with the management. And you definitely don't have a problem with that. And I took that as a compliment <laughs> because I see way too many consultants who go out there and if management says something, they say, yes, I think that's a really good idea, no matter if they agree or not. Of course, you need to be able to say it in a nice way. But if you don't agree, you should open your mouth. Not all the time, only if it's important. And it, then if they ask for it, you do it. I tried that when I worked with Siemens in Germany. And this manager said to me, how hard can it be to, to be an agile coach? Could I be it? And I was kind of like, OK, he was a top level manager. And I said, do you want my, my real answer? And he says, yes, of course. He says, no, you will be a horrible agile coach. You ask people something, but you don't listen to their answer. You jump on to the next one before the first one is done. So you kind of show a superficial interest, but you don't really listen to what people are saying. And you need to be able to listen to people and give them your attention if you want to be an agile coach. Um, nobody ever told him that before. I could see that on the faces of the other people. <laughs> um, so that's part of what I do. So another part of it is uh, showing my lack of knowledge. So when I worked in Danske Bank, we were working with Danish Indian teams. And I, at that point, I had no clue about Indian culture. We had four Indian coaches who were flown to Denmark, so we had a month of getting to know each other, and then they went back to India. So they were working with the Indian parts of our teams, and we were working with the Danish parts. So I was in this meeting uh, doing my first retrospective um, with distributed teams. And because Shiva was in there, and I knew that he'd done this before, I asked him if he would do the facilitation, because I didn't do this before. And this was, had an amazing effect because I was the senior agile coach, whatever that means. Uh, and asking him for help meant so much to him. Also because I was from the mother company. I don't know how it is here, but in Denmark, you tend to have the mother company in Denmark, and then you have the Indian labor, kind of. And a lot of people treat the Indians really horrible because they're just a cheap labor. And treating him first of all, as an equal, and second of all, asking him for help, actually made our collaboration so much better. And it also showed the other Danish people how they should interact with them. So this was about showing my vulnerability. Um, this, is me, this is me being an IBM consultant, <laughs> actually. Um, they also did say they never had IBM consultants like me before. So this is me doing the crane from Karate Kid. Uh, training my ninja apprentice. Um, and I know it looks silly, but what it does for me is it allows people to be vulnerable in front of me, which means that they ask me questions and they are not afraid to fail because they know I can be silly. I do, well, I'm, I'm actually out of glitter tattoos, but I do spread glitter. So I have these cool glitter tattoos that I bring to conferences and I give people glitter tattoos. You'll be amazed about the amount of people who had a glitter tattoo during the last three years. Um, also a lot of men, yeah. It does work with a bald head because there are tiny, tiny hairs. We tried that, yeah. It, well, it didn't last for very long. Yeah. So I do offer glitter tattoos because I think that putting in a bit of silliness in our life is very, very important. I offer free hugs. And the reason I offer free hugs is because I think we don't talk enough to each other. Or rather, we talk to each other, but not with each other. So Steve was talking about dialogue. And I think uh, we don't do that enough. We don't look at each other. Walk down the streets, at least in Europe, nobody will be looking at you. People will go to enormous amounts of effort to not look at you. And we tend to do that a lot. We don't look in people's eyes. So to me, a hug is giving my full attention to that person for just a moment. And that's why I also offer hugs to strangers. Um, 
And what's very important is never force a hug on anyone because you need to respect people. A lot of people have personal boundaries that are not suitable for hugs. Uh, so my friend Jens says that his favorite hug is a good handshake. Uh, and I think this is very important. So to me, offering these hugs is offering my attention, which means that I don't literally need to hug people. I can also just stand there, talk with them, and give them my full attention. And maybe think about this. When was the last time you gave another person your full attention? Um, this is also from Danske Bank. They had these really cool automatic doors, so when I would go to lunch, I would just do this. Um, and actually, I, I just noticed recently that I've started doing this without thinking about it, so people sometimes look at me at the supermarket. But I think it's fun. And what I realized is that this actually activated that some of the Indians came to me and says, can I ask you questions? So it turned out that this was again Shiva actually, who knew me and who known me for a long time. He came up to me after half a year in Denmark and started asking questions. And they were not stupid. They were just because he was not from the Danish culture. And he asked me stuff like, <laughs> actually some of them were like, why do you have Christmas trees in the house? Mm, that's a really good question. I, I know when it started, but I have no clue why we put a tr Christmas tree in the house. Or why we hang glittery balls on them. It's like, why? And a lot of them were about how do we act? How do we talk to each other? So they were not silly at all. But he'd been walking around with these people for six months and being afraid of asking them. And I think this is one of the things we can do as Agile coaches is that if we sometimes act silly, we make it easier for people to come to us with their silly questions. And they are rarely silly. I've never had a silly question unless it was meant to be silly. So um, when we're Agile, I think that being brave is very important because change is a part of every day. Basically, that's what we do. We change all the time. The most important thing in Agile is inspect and adapt. So if you don't remember anything else about Agile, inspect and adapt is it. Um, we aim to fail fast. So that's one of the things we do in Agile is we want, if we want to fail, we want to fail fast. And to be able to fail fast, we need to take chances, and to take chances, you need to be brave. So we won't fail. And I actually think that's a really big problem in a lot of companies is we have a zero-fault culture, which means we're not allowed to make mistakes. But if you're not allowed to make mistakes, you don't take any chances, which means you don't get innovation. You don't get all the cool stuff. You just get all the boring stuff because you don't take any chances. Asking for help. So part of what we do in Agile is ask for help. If you look at the daily scrum, uh, we have the last questions, do I have any impediments? And that's actually something that I find people have a lot of difficulty with. Because if I say I have an impediment, I'm saying I'm not good enough to handle this myself. So I'm making myself vulnerable going in and saying, yes, I've been sitting with this code for two days. I need help. I can't figure out how to get this algorithm to work. I can't find this bug. I don't know enough about databases. So all these things about asking for help, or maybe even asking for help when you don't need it, and saying, well, I'm kind of half done, but it would be nice if you would sit down with me and look at it. That is something that requires courage. And I think that is why courage is one of the Scrum values, is the asking for help. There's also the other side of it. Yeah, I'm just going to check if I had it on the slide. It's offering help. Because offering help can be equally dangerous. So going out to your colleague and saying, OK, I've seen you sitting with this problem for two days. Is there somewhere I can help you? That also takes a lot of courage to offer help. Because some might take it as, OK, you, you don't know what you're doing, so I need to help you. Even though you're saying, I just want to help you so we can succeed as a team, some people might not want help. So offering your help can also need a lot of courage. Talking to managers depends on where you are, of course. But a lot of the time, we need to talk to managers who are also the people deciding what our next paycheck will be, 
or if we get a raise, or if we get a personal um, check mark in a book or something. So that takes some courage to go in and talk to managers and maybe saying to them, I'm sorry, we cannot meet this goal. So there's a lot of stuff in Agile where we may need to talk to managers. And they're actually nice people, most of them. Um, we have a lot of conflicts. There's always conflict. And what happens is we don't see the conflict. So um, being brave enough to bring up this conflict. So I'm working with Lego. And one of the problems in, in Lego is that they are nice. They are really, really nice people, which means that they try to avoid conflict. But avoiding a conflict doesn't make it go away. It makes it simmer inside you until maybe someday you will just yell something at somebody else. Or it might just hurt your work every day. So not talking about conflict is not very helpful. So I think that if you have a really good team, you should have constructive conflicts. Not every day, but most of the time. And, but bringing these conflicts up needs courage. We also often, often meet a lot of resistance. Or as I'm starting to teach myself, to call it pushback. Because it's not really resistance. It's about pushing back. So can I borrow you, Sam? So if we stand with our hands like this, and I push, Sam pushes back. That's a pushback. That's not resistance. So if we push something on people, they're not resisting. They're just pushing back. Um, and it also takes a lot of courage working with people who are pushing back. Because we want to help these people. And some of them are terrified because they don't know that we are trying to help them. So helping these people and maybe not helping them if their pushback is too big. Actually, not helping is really, really hard as well. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. Oops. So as a wrap up, um, be yourself. I think it's very important to be yourself and be all of yourself. Because we are whole people. And we hurt ourselves every time we put on a facade. Um, you are unique. You are all unique. So you need to find that uniqueness that is you. Uh, and I also like to, a quote from, if you don't know who Brené Brown is, you should really look at her. She does wonderful talks about also being vulnerable. And she says, we are all perfect in our imperfections. So we are perfect beings because of all the imperfections that we have. That's what makes us human. And I think that is very, very important, is that we are all perfect. Have fun. Has nothing to do with brave, but you should have fun. Uh, I think it's very important that we have fun at work. And we spend so much time at work that we should have fun. Um, and ask for help. It is really, really difficult. But we need to do this. We cannot do everything on our own. Uh, I used to think that asking for help was me being weak. And now, actually, I know that it's not. It's just me realizing that I'm not able to help myself. So one month ago, for instance, I started getting stressed again. I started having too many commitments, too many things to do at the same time. And I'm not able to stop that myself. But what I am able to do is to ask friends. So I had a friend come over, and we went through all my commitments. And she really challenged me on what I could say no to and what I couldn't. And we put the rest into my spreadsheets, so I have them in control. <laughs> um, but I need to ask for help for that, because I am not able to do that myself. So I think that's very important, is we all, at some point, need to ask for help. And be vulnerable. You will get so much out of being vulnerable. And then spread some joy. It's free to spread joy, and it makes our lives so much better. So one of the things I found out during the last three, four years is that everything is coming together. So one of my sayings as a kid that I've been hiding for many years is, we can make the world a better place if we do things that matter a little to me, but a lot to somebody else. So we can open the door for someone who has their hands full. We can smile at somebody. 
We can give them a ride if we have a car. All these things will help make the world a better place. And spreading joy is part of making the world a better place. But the most important takeaway is to be yourself. Because no matter who you are, you are perfect. You are truly perfect, so be yourself. And I totally love connecting. Um, so I put up a lot of these things. I'm always up for coffee. Well, if you're in Europe, come to Denmark. I'll be up for coffee. <laughs> uh, but I'll also be here the, the rest of the week. Um, but I'm on, I'm on Twitter. And I'm on, on mail. I have my business cards here if you want. And I'm always willing to talk about all these things. Um, so please feel free to connect. So we have four minutes for questions, if anyone. Brené Brown, um, B-R-E-N-E -E Brown. She has uh, two TED Talks as well, one about vulnerability. I'm not sure what the other one's about because it's on my to-do list. Um, shame, yeah, shame. And she wrote wonderful books. One of the best books I wrote, I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Uh, which is a book I think uh, all women should read and most men. Um, <laughs> it, it is targeted at women, but what she found out was that actually a lot of the patterns in there apply for men. So she was looking into uh, what causes shame in women. And she found out that it's different things that causes shame in men because of our culture, but it's the same things we have to do to work with it. So it's a really good book. So being yourself in an authentic way in a hostile environment. Well, one thing you could do is leave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but I think that um, I think that to me, it required a lot of courage to become myself. And I actually have a problem with it with my family. So. Surprisingly enough, I'm not as honest on Facebook as I am on Twitter because my family is there. I won't call it a hostile environment, but still they think some of the things I do is stupid, like playing with Lego and stuff like that. Um, so sometimes you can't be yourself in a hostile environment, but you can start building on it and bringing more and more. And I think that if the, host if the environment is hostile, I would seriously consider leaving. Uh, but it takes some confidence, and if you can have some friends help you, and then take small steps in being yourself, opening up. I think almost everything we do that changes, we need to take tiny baby steps. Like, if you want to go running, the first thing you should do is buy a pair of shoes. And that's okay to have that as the first step. So being yourself, you can also take that in tiny steps. And maybe you would be surprised and find out that the environment is not that hostile as you are, because you will be the example that it's okay to be yourself. And sometimes you will be surprised at how people react to that. Well, I think it's good that I get a good pay. Um, that I have a, a job, they don't care if it's Lego, except for the ones with kids. No, actually, my sister and my brother are very, very supportive. Um, and they totally love it. And they say, I'm not allowed to leave there until their kids are at least 15. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, get Lego for half, I get Lego for half price. Um, but yeah, they still think it is, um, my parents still think it's a bit silly to work at Lego and to play with Lego all day, because that's what they think I do. <laughs> No, I don't. But I, I know some of the cool stuff that comes next year, and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah, and I actually think that uh, Steve also mentioned it in his keynote. Diane Larson did this cool talk about the best job ever. Uh, I will tweet uh, a link to that as well. Um, where actually she says that her father made a little bit fun of her mother because she liked her job, so it's not a real job when you like it. And I think we still have this. We still have. So we work when we sit in front of the computer and type. That's when we work. And I mean, that's just, even if you just take programming, that is so little part of programming. There's so much thinking analysis. There's so much, even when you have fun, uh, even if you are going bowling, you're actually sometimes working because you're building relationships, you're building connections. And maybe sometimes you'll be standing there while Bob is bowling and saying, oh, I just thought about this thing. Maybe we can do this at work. And I think that's, that it, it does require, in, at least in certain environments, well, now with Lego, it's actually very well seen to, I mean, if you have a compiler that takes a long time to build, people go buy Lego models and build them while they wait. So in that area, it's very much uh, allowed to play. But I think in a lot of areas, you need to be, you need to be very courageous to have fun at work. And that's really, really difficult. So that's something, again, we need to take in small steps. And we also need to work with people surrounding and saying, okay, this is actually part of how we work and maybe involving them as well. Um, so play with management. You can, I've made them play, i made management play with Lego or throw, do the ballpoint game and stuff like that. So it's not impossible. Okay, see if there are no more questions. Feel free to come up to me and ask um, later. Thank you.